Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's event. We're, uh, we're thrilled to have you and we'll just give a few moments here for the virtual room to fill up. Welcome once again to uh, today's event, Canada's Net Zero Future, Making the Transition Prosperous and Equitable. I'm Elizabeth Schert, uh, Managing Director of Globe Series, and we are pleased to be powering this event uh, on behalf of our host, the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices. This event is available in English and French. Um, to adjust your language to French, you can click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen. Cet événement est disponible en anglais et en français. Pour ajuster votre langue au français, cliquez sur l'icône représentant un globe en bas de votre écran. Before we start things today, uh, I want to take a moment to acknowledge I have the privilege of joining you from the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Squamish, uh, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam First Nations, also known as Vancouver. And I'd like to invite each of you to take a moment uh, to reflect on the land you're joining us from uh, and get flexing that interactivity muscle uh, by using the chat to share details on the connection that you feel with the place that you live, uh, where you're joining from, or, or maybe uh, another place that you feel a strong connection to. So please, uh, I'll invite you to do that now using the chat function. GLOBE prides itself on holding tough conversations. Uh, we convene a wide variety of perspectives and we're a forum for meaningful discussion and most importantly, outcomes and action. With hundreds of attendees joining on the line today, we're bound to disagree on some of what we talk about uh, regarding the transition to uh, Canada's net zero future and the transformation of our economy. We welcome debate an honest dialogue, and we ask everyone to engage with one another, one another respectfully uh, over the next 75 minutes. And of course, we are all here together uh, across the country and, and even beyond for the next 75 minutes. Um, we have a diverse panel of Canadian leaders joining us to share their perspectives and dive a little deeper into the net zero conversation to understand the policy, technology, and investment choices that are going to be required to ensure that transformation to a net zero economy is prosperous and equitable for all. Um, finally, we will get to answer some of your questions. So please be sure to add them into the chat throughout the event and make sure when you're sending through those questions that you select all panelists and attendees so everyone can see the questions that you're putting forward. To kick us off, um, I want to start with a poll. Uh, we want to have a sense of who's in the room here with us um, and, and where you're coming from as you join this conversation. So we'd like to get your take on what matters to you the most when thinking about how Canada should approach a net zero transition or transformation of our economy. You can choose three uh, options from the list below. Um, is it most important to protect the competitiveness of the Canadian economy, uh, to provide supports for low income households, to ensure historically marginalized groups get to benefit equally, uh, to not subsidize the transition of those that have uh, historically contributed to the problem, to prioritize actions that provide employment and local economic development, to stimulate addressing social problems like poverty and uh, sorry, simultaneously address social problems like poverty and racism, to support workers who might get displaced or, or to help Canada win the race to be a leading exporter. So choose up to three, uh, submit your answers. So I'm gonna choose mine uh, and we'll see uh, what the thinking is. Thanks for sharing those responses. It's always great to understand uh, for, for, for us as hosts, as well as for our speakers today, um, the perspectives that the audience are, is bringing to the table. 
So while we're getting those poll results, and there they are, uh, you can scroll down if you uh, if you look at the right hand side of the poll pop up, you can scroll down to see and and a wide uh, mix um, of responses of of where uh, the audience today sees being um, the most important factors as we look to approach that net zero transformation. Once again, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here uh, hosting this event uh, along with the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices. And as some of you will know, uh, in February, the Institute released its comprehensive modeling report on pathways for Canada to achieve net zero. Uh, on February 19th, we partnered again with the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices to help them launch that critical piece of work. And what became very clear from that first discussion was that as we consider the pathways, the decisions and the choices that are going to be required to reach our net zero ambition, we need a framework that ensures that transformation of our economy to that net zero future is both prosperous and equitable for all. And so we have an incredible lineup of speakers joining us today to continue that conversation um, and, and to address uh, both the opportunities and the challenges of ensuring that transformation to a net zero economy is inclusive and is benefiting our communities, our societies, as well as achieving our environmental goals. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand over to Dale, uh, Vice President of Research and Analysis with the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices, who will be guiding our discussion today. Dale, over to you. Great, thanks so much, Elizabeth, for the intro and for hosting us today. I'm really excited to bring together a really, really talented and impressive panel to chat about net zero pathways. So let me introduce you to that panel. Uh, and as I introduce you panelists, you can pop on your video and give the crowd a wave. So first we have Kekin Suks, Judith Sayers, who is the president of the Nechalneth Tribal Council. Hi, Judith. We have Kat Abreu, executive director of the Climate Action Network for Canada. Suzanne Goldberg, director of policy for Canada for ChargePoint. And Shirley Speakman, senior partner, Cycle Capital Management. So panel, we're going to give you lots of chance to engage in some hard questions and go back and forth. I am encouraging you to flag me down, as we talked about earlier, to, to get into that conversation. If you hear something that you want to respond to, then let's do it. Let's make this as much of a conversation as we can. Uh, I won't be afraid to wade in a little bit as well. Audience members, you'll have your chance. So think carefully about the questions you want to bring and the issues you want to raise for this panel. Uh, you'll have a chance for that as well, too. So let me start with this question, and we'll maybe go across the panel one by one for this first one. The, the Institute, as, as uh, Elizabeth noted, put out this paper exploring different pathways to net zero. But let me ask you this. Are some pathways better than others? Are there good pathways and bad pathways? If so, what makes, what differentiates those pathways? What makes a pathway desirable? Uh, Kat, why don't we start with you? All right. Um, thanks for throwing me the easy first answer. Um, I'm here for you. <laughs> Uh, hi, everyone. Really, um, such a pleasure to be with you today. And I'm calling in from unceded Algonquin Anishinaabeg territories in what is also known as Ottawa. So a few things come to mind for me, Dale. First of all, we are one of the only OECD country, in fact, the o only OECD, OECD country in which emissions have risen year over year since 2016. So from my perspective, a desirable pathway, part of what makes a, desire, a pathway more desirable for Canada is that it will bend the curve of emissions as soon as possible. <laughs> because we're feeling the impacts of climate change right now. And so we need to be reducing emissions right now. Um, when we think about the kind of larger societal context, I think there's a, a um, there can be a bit of a temptation to be attracted to pathways that um, seemingly in the short term don't offer a lot of disruption to people's lives. Uh, because I think we're all under this impression that um, people don't want things to change. 
But I would say that there are a lot of things about people's lives that they might be interested in changing. So people might be experiencing structural inequities um, that they want to address. People might be experiencing air pollution, um, sea level rise, you know, a whole host of climate impacts. People might be um, experiencing a challenge entering into a workforce or finding a job that feels meaningful to them. And so there are, in fact, a whole bunch of changes that would be very welcome to people's everyday lives that we can um, pursue with certain pathways to net zero. Um, and this is this whole idea of really trying to uh, go after those co-benefits associated with climate action. Um, and so I think for me, a desirable part of what makes a desirable pathway is whether it integrates some of those social outcomes, whether it helps people live in and build better, healthier communities. And then the final thing I'll say on this is when we talk about net zero by 2050, a lot of the conversation revolves around technology, future technologies that might be available or might be scaled up in order to you know, save us from ourselves at some point in the future. Um, and the thing we really have to keep in mind there is whether there will be social consent consensus for the deployment of those kinds of technologies. So from my perspective, um, those pathways that rely as least as possible on future technological deployment um, in a kind of uncertain landscape over whether that will be feasible uh, uh, feel more desirable for me. Perfect, thanks. Judith, how about you? you do you want to take a first shot at this at what makes a desirable pathway? Well, you know, at this point in our existence, I think that we're gonna to have to take as many pathways as we can and what it is that you feel is the way you should walk. You know, I look at our new town of territories and our oceans are warming, uh, pollution, um, the heat has affected our forests, which give us our medicine and are there for have ecosystems and places for our wildlife. And, you know, for me, how do we get to the point where we can go back to our way of life and being able to fully exercise our rights in the ocean and on the land with the lands and animals? And, you know, for us, you know, um, protesting or, or going against um, things that are going to impact the land occupies too much of our time. You know, so, you know, we really need governments to be looking at industries that are going to be developed that do not have the um, negative impact on the lands and waters, but they do it all the time. Money and jobs is what they're after. And I always find that very difficult to work with. Uh, so, you know, there are so many other technologies out there and are developing that while you may be losing some jobs in the forestry industry, you might be increasing jobs in the fishery because, you know, um, right now, thing, lots of low runs and, you know, things aren't like they used to be. So for me, um, choosing pathways and switching pathways. If something better comes along, let's go for it. Because I just think we need to be running along these pathways and doing what we can at this point in time. You know, I, I think some of the issues we're facing right now and the fear of COVID, I, I can't help but think that some of the things that we're creating is because of the way we're living and what we're doing. And we need to stop that. So we don't have to live in the fear of, for our lives based on some of these viruses that are here now and are likely to come in the future. So thank you, Dale. Super answer, thank you. Shirley, let's go to you. Um, well, just to pull on the thread that Catherine introduced, I think we, I think we finally have got uh, political, a certain level of political will and coordination that gives us a unique opportunity to, to, to really um, mobilize, to really mobilize, right? We've got a moment of momentum. And for me, the pa a pathway would be one that actually does bend the curve and leverages the, what, what is a unique opportunity uh, for us collectively to, to ensure that we have the political will to make some of the big changes that we need to make happen, occur. Suzanne? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dale. I, I might, um, you know, 
uh, continue on what what the other speakers have said, and I just say that I I really like this this question because I think it calls out the real world dynamics that ultimately influence what what pathways are are adopted. And I, you know I think Hat mentioned this the co the co benefits um, beyond what we might identify in models. And and don't get me wrong, models are helpful. And Dale and I did our our master uh, master's projects modeling, but you know, beyond technological feasibility, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and, you know, economic efficiency and the cost per ton. I think it's really looking at the factors that support a sustainable transition in different sectors across our economy. So when I think of a desirable pathway, I'm thinking of, you know, are we utilizing solutions that consumers and businesses want and private investment is flowing? Are we creating new oppor uh, economic opportunities and jobs? And then are we delivering environmental benefits beyond just greenhouse gas emissions? So, you know, speakers have mentioned, you know, clean air and the associated health benefits. And then another critical piece is, you know, are all, are all these benefits flowing to a broad group of individuals across, across Canada? And, you know, from, from my space and transportation electrification, I'll just pick on it because I think it's a really great example of a net zero pathway that kind of has a, a really good climate punch um, is already picking up you know, great, great momentum as, as a pathway. And just as a, a starting point, you know, Canadians uh, drive and, and buy the most polluting vehicles and EVs really deliver a significant emission reduction um, benefit. And we can take advantage of our already clean grid and, and grid that's getting cleaner. And beyond the climate benefits, because we were talking about co-benefits or, or mutual benefits, transportation electrification delivers really a wide range of, of these benefits and reducing fuel and maintenance costs, for example, for if you commute, or if you're a fleet or improved air quality, if you live in communities with um, lots of commercial vehicle traffic or, or low air quality, so electrifying our, our commercial vehicles, or if you take public transit, also making you know, electric mobility options accessible in, in, in that uh, particular mode. And you know, the other thing I just wanna say on this is you know, within the perspective of, of or the framework of, of producing solutions and pathways that consumers and businesses want, you know, I think there was a comment about transformation and, and things that might be uncomfortable. Um, you know, I think transportation electrification is a transformation, but one that consumers are being drawn to. And, you know, the last point I'll, I'll make here is that, you know, recent study after study have shown consumer interest in, in electric mobility. And just a recent study showed that seven out of 10 new vehicle buyers are interested in EVs. And we see automakers investing billions of dollars. So, you know, those are just one, one example of to highlight some of those points I raised. Okay, thanks, Olivia. That's a great start for us. And I, I'm gonna push something back at you and challenge you a little bit here because what we saw in the poll that Elizabeth put out and what we heard from all of you is a bunch of different criteria for successful transitions, that they actually do transition, they actually work, that they're actually likely, that they're possible, but also that they are kind of economically sensible and they make sense for, for jobs and for economic activity, and they make sense from a fairness perspective. What if there's trade-offs? Are there trade-offs? Do, do different pathways emphasize some of those outcomes more than others? Can we make trade-offs? So let me maybe give you one example. If it is, if, if one path might be more desirable and check more of those boxes, okay. but it's harder to do. So there's still chance. Are we okay on sound? Yeah. If one of those pathways is harder to do, but delivers better outcomes. Is that a good deal or a bad deal? Anybody, wave me down if you want in. I mean, I might hop in. Please. Um, you know, I think like a part of the answer to that question is what are the tools that governments are using to assess the relative value of certain pathways over others? And I think we're just still in the midst of trying to develop those tools. So you know, full disclosure, I'm on this new recently announced net zero advisory body um, to the federal government. They're, you know, the, the very existence of the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices is a relatively new initiative in Canada. Um, and that's what's happening at the federal scale, um, not, I, you know, I can't really speak to what might be happening at the provincial scale. So part of that question is like, what are the frameworks that we're using to help us make those decisions? So, you know, one of those frameworks might be, and this, we've seen this in other jurisdictions, developing a kind of carbon budget approach where um, that carbon budget helps us make explicit some of the implicit implications of our decisions around certain kinds of policy um, directions or investments uh, as we you know, move toward emissions reductions goals. 
Canada has so far chosen not to deploy a carbon budgeting approach. So are there other kinds of um, frameworks that we should be developing and using to help governments make those choices? What kinds of interactions with the general public and how does that interaction with the general public occur? So, you know, we had the Just Transition Task Force on uh, for coal workers and communities, and they went to every single community that had workers dependent on the coal industry and spoke to them. How do we make sure that that kind of direct communication at the community level can continue to happen as this transition unfolds so that we're really hearing directly from people? Thanks, Kat. We're going to do more on policies and how we actually walk these pathways in a minute. So I'll come back to some of those points. But I'm not quite ready to give up yet. I, I don't want to let us skate through this idea that we want all these all these good outcomes from our pathways. And I, I want to be convinced that it's, it's not necessary to make trade-offs. And if we do have to make trade-offs, I want to hear a little bit more about how we do, how we should. Shirley, and then Suzanne. Sure. Um, so Dale, maybe I'm, I'm a, a contrarian, I don't know, but I, I, I fundamentally believe that we, our, our pursuit should be in, in reducing emissions, right? That is an exist, existential threat to us. And we absolutely should try to create those, those co-benefits. Sadly, I think that in the short term, there will be, there will be people that are hurt, right? Um, oil workers uh, in Alberta will, will lose their job. But what we should be doing is putting in the necessary systems and support like, like we've done with COVID. We've proved that we can, we can, we can make this system work for, the, work for people when, when we have a crisis to address. So we should be putting in the necessary support to transition workers to, to address um, and, and to make it um, as easy as possible for people to accept that the transition must occur, right? Um, so as, as Suzanne has pointed out, right now there's people who are well, ready, willing and able to adopt uh, electric vehicles, fantastic. Um, if, if there is a way we can get people um, to a similar point on other issues, I think that sh that's, that's uh, a goal for us, but at the end of the day, we, we do have to reduce emissions. And so I think, in, I, I just want to acknowledge that I think that there will be trade-offs. I think that there will be people in the short term who are hurt, but I think it's our responsibility to try to minimize and mitigate it as much as possible. And okay, maybe that's, but it's, it's, it's what I believe. Thanks, Shirley. We're going to go policy soon, but that, before we do that, quick hits on trade-offs from first Suzanne and then Judith. Yeah, and I'll just pick up on what, what Shirley said, like, I, I won't repeat the, you know, the acknowledgement that there are trade-offs, but, you know, Shirley, I think you touched on something which was, you know, we need to reduce emissions, and when we set that objective, um, we, we can create opportunities and focusing on those opportunities, and, you know, we put a clear policy, well, I know, Dale, you don't want to get me want me to get into policy, but if we set a clear benchmark in terms of the GHG target we want to get to, you know, we send a clear, clear signal and, and give time for businesses and communities to, to adapt. And I think that's, that's really key. And from there, innovation happens. And then, you know, we're, we're talking about, if we can talk about trade-offs at the, the level of a consumer or a business, you know, innovation will respond to that. They will, will make products and services and community exercises that you know individuals and, and Canadians want. So I, I think we have that opportunity there. And and as you said, you know, new products and services will spur jobs. And and I think the key there is making sure that we are training appropriately and also just making people aware of these new opportunities. Education is is a critical piece as as these pieces move so so rapidly. Perfect, Judith. Who makes the decisions on trade-offs? You know, uh, is it question. consumers? Is it companies? Is it the government? Here on Vancouver Island, I've been ahead of um, the Island Corridor Foundation. We run the rail on Vancouver Island. We've been trying to get the government to support us and put rail in place so we don't have to widen the highway. We reduce greenhouse gases. We take traffic off the Valahat. Um, but the government doesn't care. 
they think they can put buses in place or they just won't support us. And, you know, those are the kind of things that we'd love to get our train up front. We need some capital. And for me, you know, if we're going to embrace clean BC and emissions and the new federal law, then we need to have that political commitment and we need for everybody to have, you know, some idea of what those trade-offs are. Because as First Nations people, they're asking us to make trade-offs every day agree to site C, agree to Trans Mountain, mm -hmm. you know, you'll get jobs, you'll get money. But in the end, we're not reducing those net zero. We might be able to negotiate higher environmental standards, but if we can't live the way we want to live, is that really the kind of trade-offs that we want? And so that's, you know, so do some people have to make more sacrifices than others for the sake of trade-offs? I think that's a big question that we need to have a good discussion about. Thank you. Okay, look, that I want to go, I was going to ask about policy, how we, how we make policy choices at all orders of government to thread the needle, to try to hit as many of those objectives in the way to net zero as possible. But I take to this point, and let's expand that, not just policy choices, but also governance choices. I think both of those things matter in, in different ways. So I'll open it to either or both if you want to. Uh, Judith, do you want to elaborate since you started that thread, or do you want me to come back to you? Uh, maybe you can come back to me. Will do. Okay. Anybody else? I'll pick on you if you don't volunteer. Okay, Shirley, you're up. So, Dale, just reframe, can you reframe the question for me? Because I'd be what happy kind of, to answer, but I want to make sure I'm understanding. I'm asking about the policy choices that we should advance, that governments at all orders should advance, both to deliver on net zero, but also deliver on these other objectives that make some pathways better than others. How do we walk these desirable pathways? Sure, so let me, let me answer it from my day job perspective. Please. So as a, as a senior partner at a venture capital fund, um, what I need and what the companies need that I invest in, they need certainty. Like they, they, they need to know that there is a plan and that the plan isn't gonna change on them. Because when we, we make a decision to invest in a company, oftentimes it's because, um, uh, let me try it differently. Sometimes we don't make an investment in a company because we are uncertain about the regulatory impact or the policy impact that is, is surrounding the company, which, which obviously increases the risk, it, which increases our expected return. And when you work through those numbers, and, and sadly it often does come down to numbers, I, I can say, no, the risk is too high for the people that provided me capital to invest in this fund. So what I will say is I am very happy that the Supreme Court ruled in favor of a carbon tax. That might not be, be a, a favorable or a, 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 a well-received uh, perspective by many, but I think if, if the only thing it did is reduce uncertainty, that's a good thing. And I think as we talk about policies and regulations, it's really important to provide that level of certainty that we can, as a business, that it can plan around. Fantastic. Judith. So say the government decides um, as their policy, they're gonna try and net zero by 2050, they're gonna adopt this, but they keep on approving um, industries that are emitting greenhouse gases without reducing in other places. And, you know, so we really need to somehow, I, I don't know how, because, you know, we, we can input into those policies, but in the end, it's, it's the government at whatever level. And is it really even the government or is it just, you know, a certain few people in the government that choose those um, industries? And, and so as a matter of governance, we really have to, you know, because they tell us, well, it's who you elect, but if people that we elect don't really have the say that they mean or don't have the kind of values that we need to really look at net zero, that, you know, we have to look at other solutions other than greenhouse gas emission, transportations or industries, uh, then, then we have a problem. And so I don't know if this whole public policy discussions are inclusive enough of the people who really impact them. So the communities that live around them, whether they're First Nations or other communities, and yeah, they might get the jobs, but what does that mean for their health, for their air, for all of those things? And, and so I just think that um, the processes that we have set up in right now just really aren't effective enough in being inclusive of benefiting the people 
and doing what the people want. Pat, you want in? Yeah. Yeah, I'll hop in. So a few thoughts. Number one, I, I mean, we kind of need to do some real thinking around what what's the enabling landscape of policy and governance that's going to that's going to lock in um, this kind of policy durability that Shirley's been talking about and create uh, the table at which we continue to have conversations about our pathway to net zero in the future. So this motivation for kind of settling set, setting up that enabling landscape is big part of why we work on Canadian climate accountability. Um, we now have Bill C-12, the Net Zero Accountability Act. And a part of what that bill is trying to do is bring some predictability, some um, formalization to what has so far been a very ad hoc process of climate planning in Canada, uh, where you know we maybe have a government that cares about climate change, maybe they have a climate plan, maybe we hear how they're doing on that climate plan sometime, and then come the next election cycle, who knows what will happen. Um, so I think part of what we need to be thinking about is like what are the uh, legislative institutional mechanisms that we are establishing and investing in now that are going to ensure consistency, coherence, policy durability into the future. And I think part of what's important for that in the Canadian context is those kinds of pieces, um, from my perspective, can perhaps help unpack some of the partisan politic politicking um, that we see really present in, in the climate conversation in Canada. Um, the other question I have is, are our policies designed to achieve structural systems change, or are they designed to achieve low cost incremental greenhouse gas emissions reductions? And I think for the most part, we've seen governments designing the latter. So those aren't necessarily bad policies. It's good to have incremental GHG emissions reductions. But if we want to fundamentally address the issue of climate change, if we want to be building better communities, if we want to be thinking through the future of prosperity and job creation in this country, then we need to be designing policies that are getting at that systems level, sector level transformation. And we just haven't been bold enough yet as a country, I don't think, to go there. And we really need to because we should be using tools like the upcoming 2021 budget to implement those kinds of systems structural level plans that we are making, but we're not very good at making those kinds of plans yet. Um, and those kinds of plans are really necessary because they can do things like, you know, if we want to drill down to a concrete example, um, if we're committed to carbon pricing in Canada, then perhaps we could think about some kind of policy mechanism that helps ensure some of the re revenues of the carbon pricing system go directly to BIPOC or rural or marginalized or indigenous communities um, to help them make structural changes at the community level that can build their energy autonomy, for instance. And we've seen that very action happen in California. They direct a portion of their cap and trade revenues um, directly to uh, um, marginalized communities to help them build their own energy autonomy systems. And so this is the, I think that these are the kinds of things that we need to be grappling with and we haven't quite gotten there yet in Canada. Um, and I think we really need to be getting there if we're serious about net zero. Great, I love the specificity that you're all bringing to your answers. It makes us focus on concrete things on kind of real specific choices, not general platitudes. So I love it, keep it coming. Uh, Suzanne, you haven't had a chance to weigh in on policy. I know you want to. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I hope I'm not repeating too much of, of what um, has been said already, but rather just emphasizing some of the, the key points that were raised. You know, to me, this comes down to the policy framework or approach that was, was discussed. And I, I think this was raised a number of times, you know, setting clear and long term targets for, for certainty um, and having accountability with those targets is key, but also putting the policies in place to support the achievement of those, those targets. And I, I, I think that was just discussed. And, you know, the other point I want to make, and I'll, I'll provide a bit of detail on both of these points, is that, you know, in an acknowledgement that not, no one policy is going to do it all. And when we're talking about transformational change, we're going to need a host of complementary policies. And we might not be able to allocate a GHG reduction to this or that, you know, for accounting purposes. But an acknowledgement that, that all of these are necessary, especially when we're looking at the goals of community access and, and increasing, you know, access to a number of, of solutions. So, you know, just to 
bring back to the, the first point around a clear, clear goal and, and frame it within the context of, of transportation electrification, because that's the world I live in. You know, a clear goal like an ice ban or legislated greenhouse gas emission reduction targets for a sector that like BC just introduced or, or ZEV targets say like, here's, here's where we're going. And policies like vehicle emission standards or mandates, incentives, building codes, these are our tools uh, that will get us there. And, and combined, um, to pick up on Shirley's point, these are the signals that get sent to businesses and consumers to say, we need to prepare and, and for this transition and adjust. And then my second point was on the acknowledgement that you know no one policy will get us there. And I think with transportation electrification, that's true. We're you know decades, centuries of how we fuel, drive, manufacture, and use vehicles, and we're we're totally disrupting that. And there's multiple both multiple barriers and opportunities that need to be addressed. And I think you know when we're looking at systematic transformational change, you know we need multiple policy levers. Um, and then, you know, the goal of, of equity and access and jobs requires that, that we're looking at the full spectrum of opportunities and, and barriers. And just to, to call out a couple of jurisdictions who are, are taking this approach by setting targets and then taking a multifaceted policy approach, California, BC, Quebec, um, you know, California, someone has already mentioned that has, has a big focus on, on equity with a number of its climate policies. And they have, you know, a huge, huge mix of, of addressing access to fueling and vehicles, education, industrial development, and access and equity. So I think all of those together are some, you know, core policy principles or framework that, you know, complement some of what the other speakers were talking about. Okay, there's tons of good comments happening in the chat and lots of good conversations there. And I'm not going to get to all of them, but do keep keep engaging in those questions, keep answering them to each other. I love that some of the panelists are weighing in there too. One question from the crowd is about interprovincial barriers in supporting this kind of equitable fair transition, whether it's retraining workers or kind of collaborating uh, between different orders of government across the country to support these things. Any thoughts, any reactions to that? Nobody. I think if we'd solve the, uh, the, the problem of that in Canada, uh, we, it's, it's been a longstanding issue, right? Federal, provincial uh, challenges. I, I'm hoping that, and I know hope is not a strategy, but I'm hoping that with the clear direction from the Supreme Court that carbon tax is, is uh, constitutional, that, that, we can, that it puts aside some of this issue and we can drive towards um, crafting uh, policies and actions that actually drive down emissions. So, you know, you set aside the, the partisan effect of, of trying to, to, of challenging the, the carbon tax, yeah. that decision dealt with provides clarity. So it's not, we've, we've dealt with the federal provincial challenge for a very long time. Um, and I'm not sure that the, this single issue is going to resolve that. Okay, I'm gonna keep us moving and move to a different question. So we've, we've all, or all of you have alluded to this idea of, of fairness and equity to some extent. Can we elaborate what that mean? What, what do we really mean by a just and equitable transition? There are obviously winners and losers from transitions Square that for me. Tell me what a just and equitable transition really feels and looks like. Kat, I'm going to you first. Yeah, so there are a series of structural and economic, um, or so I should say structural, social, and economic uh, inequities and challenges that are faced by individuals and communities um, across this country uh, the, that, have, that share a common root. Um, so, you know, the root, of climate change is the same in many cases when we get to that structural level as the root of you know, structural racism and um, colonial forms of extractivism um, and wealth inequality. So part of what we're getting at when we talk about a just recovery is trying to address those crises simultaneously by working on the root problem. Um, and that's in part why I, I really emphasize the need for this systems level structural transformation approach. I, I saw a few comments in the chat saying, if we distract ourselves from the crisis, the climate crisis by trying to work on these other issues, 
we're not going to get the job done. And I'm really here to say that we're not going to get the job done if we don't do it by addressing these other issues, uh, because there's just no way to um, address climate change in the long run if we don't uh, fundamentally change those structural issues that underlie the problem. Um, so, that, so that's really what we're getting at. And I, I would like to, uh, I think, lift up um, part of what Judith said earlier, which is around like, who gets to make these decisions? Um, and, and how are we designing the process around who is included in these decision-making rooms? And shout out a report that Indigenous Climate Action dropped yesterday, where they analyzed the two most recent federal climate plans from an Indigenous rights perspective and really found them incredibly wanting um, for any Indigenous rights lens. Uh, so we still have a long way to go, I think, when it comes to, to talking about climate action in Canada, um, to making sure that we are including all of the voices that, that need to be at the table um, so that we can have that structural le level conversation. Judith, do you want to react to that? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, for me, a just um, transition means that we are looking to the future, that this world doesn't belong to us. It belongs to many generations to come. And so for me, it's making sure that they have a world they can live in, that they're not living in air conditioning or, or whatever, um, not being able to um, do the things that we do. And it's also showing the younger generation that this is how we can live. This is, you know, what we're looking for, you know, and it's also, you know, for Indigenous people is making sure our children and grandchildren and seven generations can continue to exercise their their way of life, um, ability to exercise our rights in the forests, in the oceans, on the land. And you know, right now we can't do that. We're seeing more and more and more of our rights being um, taken away, impacted negatively because of the development. And as we go through COVID and all of the things that are taking a lot of money, they're going to be looking for more resources and taking more resources and how to and that impacts further on climate change so you know i think a just transition is a recognition that we need to be holistic in our thinking you know that we have to think about all of these things and you know also uh, like who is accountable you know the governments can set policies they can put in laws in place but when they don't make the targets it's a political uh, reaction. It's not anything that we can hold them to, you know, there's no, you know, the government falls or the, um, you have to put in place a, a large fund to fund health and restoration, you know, like, you know, somehow we need to find a better way to hold our leaders accountable to, to this, as well as our companies and as people, we take on that responsibility. And I think that's a just transition is that we all take responsibility for making this world a better place. And, you know, I appreciate the two reports that Catherine mentioned and, you know, I, th I think they make some really good points. Thank you. Suzanne or Shirley, do you want to end this or we'll keep moving otherwise? Let me, let me try. Cause I, I, yeah. I, and this is an honest statement. Um, sometimes I worry that we sacrifice good in the pursuit of perfection, right? And I, I know we haven't done this well in the past, right? Uh, and I, I, I do believe that people need to be at the table and it needs, because if you don't have the people at the table as part of the negotiation, as part of the crafting of the solution, then it, it's, not, it's not going to have success in the long run. But are we asking too much of this transition um, that we're trying to make in, in recognition of the fact that we have a limited opportunity, right? And, and I, I'm going to be blunt. I mean, we have a, we have a government in the U S that is finally, you know, somebody who actually believes that there's climate change. We might only have four years to craft, to craft solutions that will uh, have the benefit of this time and could, could be long-term. Um, and, and, and that's where I find myself in a quandary. How, how much can we ask this transition to do in, in light of we might only have four years to get something done? Suzanne, yeah. Yeah, I'll just add a, a little to that. And, I, and Shirley, I pre appreciate your, your reflections there. And I think, you know, I'll, I'll just add to some of these transitions are already happening. 
Um, so, you know, the question there is, and, and I totally get your point of like, we can't let perfect be the enemy of the good if that's the phrase or I just mess that up. But, um, you know, we, we are sometimes dealing with a world of second best policies and, and just achieving what, what we, we need to because anything um, that works towards that goal, um, you know, is, is success. But, you know, if we do have momentum in, in sectors, you know, like the one that I, I sit in, I think there is a responsibility for policymakers and businesses to, to step back and say, okay, we're already on, there's a trajectory here that, that seems to have forward moving momentum. Um, let, let's see how we can plan and, and engage and ensure that the access access and, and, and benefits to you know, all communities is considered. And if we are gonna put policies in place, you know, even if it isn't perfect, you know, making sure that we are at least considering that there are gonna be you know, gaps and, and equity and access issues, for example, with access to charging infrastructure or vehicles. So just being conscious of that in how we design policies and programs and understanding we might not get it right, but I think we can you know, learn from some of our uh, you know, colleagues in other jurisdictions of what has worked and what hasn't worked. Just like one example, you know, incentives for electric vehicles. New vehicles are, are out of reach for a lot of consumers. So used vehicles are income tested. You know, that's a small step. Is it perfect? I, I don't know, but you know, we're, we're at least having the conversation and I think that's important. Kat, was that a high pursuit hand I saw there? Yeah, I mean, I, surely, like I think it's absolutely fair to ask that question, um, but important to know what Suzanne is saying, which is, a lot of these transitions are underway already. So while it can seem like when we have these conversations, we're talking about a whole new thing that we have to start from scratch, that's really not the case. Um, you mentioned the US and a new partner that we have there, which is great. And in fact, Biden's climate plan has actually kind of done away with the days where we design environmental policy absent of thinking about the social consequences of it. Um, I saw yesterday that they, uh, they uh, put up their um, Environmental Justice Advisory Council um, and environmental justice and social outcomes are like deeply directly embedded in some of the climate policies that the Biden administration is proposing. And so if we wanna keep up with the US, we have to do the same. Um, and what we're talking about really is making some of those co-benefits, some of those social outcomes that already happen sometimes as a result of climate action, it, an intention of the climate policy rather than an accidental result. Like that's really what we're talking about here. <clears throat> yeah, great. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Uh, first, let me go here. What about, we've talked about on a different, different Canadians in different parts of Canada being affected differently by the transition. What about across time? What about valuing impacts in the future and costs in the future and benefits in the future versus impacts right now? Is that part of this transition story too? Unpack that for me a little bit. So, so again, let me, they'll try this from, from my day job perspective. Uh, Please. We at Cycle, before we make an investment, take a look, the, the, the name Cycle comes from the concept of life cycle analysis, right? So we do actually step back and we try to figure out what is the life cycle, what is the, the true cost of this opportunity? Um, and surprisingly, that's a that's a easy way to, to file through a lot of investment opportunities, right? So I think that there is there is a way to do that. And, and it from from our perspective, it is something that we do as, as part of our day-to-day -day job. So I would I don't know how people can say that they can't do it. Judith, do you want in? Yeah, we have to know what the future we're all looking for looks like. Is it a sustainable one? If we have destroyed the earth, um, there won't be a future or there'll be a future that's very limited uh, for people. So we have to find a way to look forward to that. You know, as, as First Nations people, we're on the front lines of all this climate change, rising sea levels, forest fires, inability to access wildlife, um, you know, and, and so if we look at different groups and the way it impacts them, you know, it impacts us a lot. So, you know, we fight from our perspective that 
we need to be making a just transition. We need to be changing this world for the better because we have taken it and we have destroyed many of its good values. And how do we retain what's here now and restore and restore it to a, a state that we can keep passing it on to the next generations? And I think that's a, a really important question, Yasdale, that you know, we really do need to, anything we craft has to be to decide what sort of future we're going to be giving to other generations. Let me make that even more pointy because some of the comments in the, in the questions in the chat are talking about politics and political feasibility. To get to that future, to make that transition feasible, does it mean that we need to compensate or address those that are bearing the costs on the way to that transition? Is that a political question or is that a fairness question? Is that both? Susie, you look contemplative. You want in? Oh, yeah, that is a pointy question. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, maybe the, the flip side to, you know, do people need to be compensated is, you know, are we focusing on, on the opportunities and, and creating, you know, new industries, new jobs, ways for consumers and businesses to save money and, and providing uh, solutions that work for everyone and, and making sure that everyone can access those, those benefits. So I, I, I'm looking at it from a different perspective, but I, I think, you know, maybe to, to soften the pointy edge, you know, how, how do we seize mm -hmm. on those economic opportunities of a growing sector in, in, in Canada or growing sectors. And, and, you know, just if we look at e-mobility and I'm sorry that that's you know, my one note, but, um, you know, we're, we're already seeing significant growth there. So how do we build on that? And, and BC just released some numbers. They estimate that there are 274 companies and organizations involved in all aspects of the EV sector, over 6,000 um, direct employment, $622 million in provincial GDP and, and $1 billion in economic um, output. So, you know, are we seizing on those, those opportunities there and, and how, how do we build on that? So, yeah. Judith, that's Asira. Judith go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Susie. I would rather not be compensated. I'd rather have what's there. And, yeah. you know, any money that's available is should be sunk into pathways and solutions for the future. What is it we can change? Can we put that money into something that is going to ensure net zero emissions? And what are the, you know, because there's a lot of things. I think I mentioned the last panel about, um, you know, BC ferries converting to electric ferries. Well, we need a lot of infrastructure. We need a lot of money to do that. That's a great goal. The same with any of the trucking industries, et cetera. But we need money to do that. So can we put money, that kind of money into something like that and just try and achieve as a goal, let's keep what's there without destroying it any further and actually enhance what's there. I, I see Kat uh, waving her fingers in agreement. So she gets to weigh in verbally too. Yeah, I mean, like Judas kind of made this point that I wanted to make, which is like, we're talking about compensating people who are going to be affected by, by the transition, but what about compensating people who are being affected by the impacts of climate change right now? Um, what if we, we talk about the trade-offs for moving to a net zero future, but we don't talk about the trade-offs that we are currently experiencing as climate chaos mounts, right? We talk about the cost of transitioning, but we don't talk about the costs of inaction. And I think, you know, this is really like the, um, I, I wanna encourage all of us to just keep this mindset, right? That this transition is not only necessary, it is inevitable. And while it might mean some changes, it might mean some expenditures, the sooner we do it, the less money it's gonna cost and the easier it's gonna be for all of us to adapt. So I, I just really wanted to drive that home and also really lift up the fact that it's about equity, right? It's about making sure that those who have been most impacted by climate change benefit most from this transition. Okay, here's a, a related, though slightly adjacent question from the audience. Many rural, Northern and resource dependent communities have experienced boom and bust cycles for decades and thus 
face unique social and economic challenges from this volatility? How can the government support these communities to diversify in a way that supports, uh, provides decent local jobs, help people stay in their homes, provides local autonomy and decision-making and incentivizes environmental benefits that are in line with their values? Judith. Can I just give one example, Dale? Please. Um, so, you know, the whole issue of clean energy, you know, British Columbia, the BC government is building Site C, and in the end, they have 25 jobs. In the meantime, yeah, they, they may employ 4,000 to construct the dam. If we were to do regional clean energy projects, we would create thousands of jobs and bring in revenue. And I think those are the kind of projects that we need to support so that we can have those year round jobs that don't, that aren't just the resource boom that we've all been used to. So that's just an example, thank you. Thank you, Susie. If we're throwing out examples, I'll, I'll throw out another Please. one and, and shocker, it's gonna be about electric mobility. Um, but, you know, from a regional perspective, EV charging installation, um, you know, to install a level two or DC fast charger, anywhere from 188 to 400 job hours, five to 10 different jobs. We're talking about people who are in the construction, logistics, sales, distribution, civil engineering, and then commercial, um, commercial logistics project managers. So, so a wide spectrum of job functions, some that are already, you know, producing and, and delivering in, in other sectors. And so there's a real regional impact when it comes to charging infrastructure. And this is, you know, if, if we are serious about our net zero pathway and that, you know, involves some form of electric mobility, we're gonna need that infrastructure and those jobs all across Canada in rural and remote areas as well. And one interesting thing is, you know, our business in the EV market more broadly continues to scale with proportionally with vehicle availability. So policies that make vehicles more available across Canada and or, you know, manufacturing the vehicles themselves in Canada can help create an increased demand and variety. So just one, one example of, of a, a net zero pathway where there's real regional impact in, in, in jobs. Okay, another question about politics. And then we'll, we're heading to the home stretch here, panelists, to prepare your final thoughts. I'll cue you in a second. Um, this question is about the idea that it's hard for our leaders to be honest about these transitions and about where they, there are pains and where there are benefits to these transitions. Any advice on how to respond to that challenge? Sorry, can you repeat that, Dale? Yeah, I think there's this this idea that there's this recognition that the transition has costs for some and imposes costs in some regions and in some communities maybe more than others, and that it's difficult for our leaders to try to guide this transition to be honest and straightforward about those kind of downsides, whether they are distributional or all. So how, how do we tackle that? How should our, we as, it, as participants in this conversation or policy leaders trying to drive this transition tackle that challenge that is political in a way, but also distributional? Um, let me, I am not a politician, but, what I, but I am a voter. And, and yep. what I appreciate in the people that I vote for are people who are transparent, um, about the decisions and the policies that they support. So um, I do try as a citizen to educate myself. Um, so what I want from, from my leaders is, are in fact leaders that are willing to take specific and hard stances and, and tell me what their programs are so that I can make an informed decision. And then, you know, in four years, if I'm not happy with what they've, with what they promised and what I signed up for, then I make a different decision. But it, it's an imperfect system. But I think being the, the message that I would give is, is I believe that people understand the imperative nature of the crisis that's in front of us. And that we have, again, a unique moment in time to bring people aboard. And, and the important message is that um, to be, transparent and, and to explain in, in fact that there will be 
that, that there are people who are suffering today, the impact of climate change, and that there will be people who will suffer uh, in the transition. But in the, law, in the medium and longer run, we have a more sustainable system. Mm -hmm. I think it's transparency. Transparency. Judith and then Kat. Okay, well, I, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if there's this kind of person out there, but, you know, uh, you've just got to have people who will live up to what they believe in and to their values and they'll do everything they can to promote those values. If it's a net zero world, then let's have all actions and turn down anything that might detract from that. Uh, you know, a lot of our politicians get swayed by the oil companies or, you know, something that will bring in revenue and jobs. But, you know, as a society, we need to be saying, you know, like for us, the most important value that we can have is to um, preserve this earth, have net zero emissions and everything that doesn't contribute to that or is an offset can't be built or can't be done. Or, you know, that my actions are going to be in putting this in place. I know that's hard and I've seen a lot of, we've seen a lot of our politicians turn away from what they said they would do and put it off. And, and I just, um, we just can't have this kind of people in power anymore. But I don't know how we, we stop that because it's just kind of the way the world goes. But, you know, in First Nations communities, a lot of our leaders are just, let's, let's ch stop this, this and this. And we don't sway from that um, because it's our future, it's our land, it's what's important to us. Uh, but you know, we're, we're not in the power, position of power in this country, unfortunately. Uh, slight so, interjection from the comment chat. You have boosters, Judith, for you being the next prime minister. So maybe power is <laughs> in your future after all. Kat, you're up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, call me in if you need someone on your campaign team. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm totally on board with Shirley. Like, as a voter, I want politicians who have the courage to help us have this national conversation that we need to have. I think a lot of the time, um, governments shy away from these kinds of conversations because they don't want to be picking winners and losers. We hear that all the time. But not making a choice is making a choice. Um, and we have a series of choices that we have to make as a country. And if we don't have politicians who have the courage to help us make those choices with clarity and with information um, and with a, a a, a line of sight to the end goal, um, then we're gonna have a real hard time coming out on top in this transition. Um, I think we also, you know, climate change is a collective problem and we need collective solutions to address it. A lot of comments in the chat about, oh, how do we address um, the, the challenges presented by Canadian federalism um, and different approaches across different orders of government? How do we get municipalities more involved um, in Canadian climate planning? How do we make sure that indigenous rights are being reflected in the ways in which um, Canada makes its climate plans? And these are all really essential questions. Um, and I think we need to be thinking about some really out of the box solutions to them. So, you know, one thing that I'll suggest is um, a really interesting proposal came from Seth Klein and uh, Gil McGowan, who's the uh, head of the Alberta Federation of Labor for maybe thinking through a new kind of federal transfer system that um, hinges around climate action and just transition. Um, and I'm not necessarily advocating for exactly that, that policy solution, but I think those kinds of ideas, thinking outside the box, thinking big and figuring out how we can kind of set the table for a conversation and effort sharing across this country will be really essential. Okay, team. So we're in the home stretch here and you're gonna get one last kick at the can. And I'm gonna start with Susie. So Susie, get yourself ready. But here's my question to set you up. I've, I, this is kind of inspired by Shirley to some extent that we've been talking about both the desirability of different pathways in terms of equity, in terms of outcomes, uh, but we've also been talking about the feasibility of these pathways and the extent to which they're even, some are easier or harder or more or less likely. One of the questions in the chat talks about the idea that just as just transition sounds great, but does it, is, is trying to address everything a barrier to addressing the first order challenge, which is the emissions reductions. So here's my final question for you. Feasibility and desirability, are they in opposition? Are they together? Do they push against each other or do they go alongside each other? Reconcile that tension or tell me it's not a tension uh, if you can. 
Suzanne first and Shirley second. Hey, um, hey, going first. Um, I think, you know, my perspective is they, if there's tension there, then, then maybe it's not going to be a successful solution. Um, and a, a solution needs to be both feasible and, and desirable and, and deliver benefits to, to everyone. So again, just like circling back to, you know, electric mobility, is it feasible? Yes, we have technology solutions available. Do consumers and businesses want it? Yes, they're purchasing them. You know, is, is, is private sector investment flowing? So there's a desirability there. Is it delivering co-benefits? Yes, you know, these, these different factors need to come together in order um, to see a successful pathway really stand at the test of time and be a significant contributor to our, our net zero goals. And, and, you know, just, you made that point about, you know, can, can we move forward with that without, um, and have a conversation about just transition? I think having the conversation is important from the beginning. And I believe someone made this point earlier. It can't be reactive. It needs to be part of the conversation. Doesn't mean we get it right from the start, but, but it needs to be part of our, our planning. So that's, that's my final thought there. Thanks, Suzanne. Okay, Shirley, you're up and Kat, cue yourself. You're next in the queue. You're on mute, Shirley. There you it has go. to happen in at least good. once, once in every Zoom morning. call. You've met the quota. <laughs> So let me let me say I think I probably needed a little bit more time on this one, but I think that um, a feasible the high the highest probability feasible solutions are also desirable solutions. Mm. Right. So if I've taken anything away from today's discussion, it's that they they aren't mutually exclusive. That that which was an incidental is actually should be made, uh, an incidental byproduct should actually be made a tangible, right, a expectation. And, and I, so for me, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I think just making sure we establish the breadth of desirability <laughs> is, is important, right? Because we do have, and I'll say it again, this, this moment where we have, I, I believe, public attention on this, political will towards this. And I would really hate to lose this opportunity in pursuit of perfection. Well said, you didn't need more time at all. Okay, Kat. Um, anything's feasible if, it, if you desire it enough. Um, I think, you know, I think that's really the fundamental truth. And I recall the, you know, one of the core findings of the 2018 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's report on global warming of 1.5 degrees, where they said really bluntly, we have the technology to make this transition possible. We have it now. Sure, there are a couple of technology developments that we'll wait on um, that we need to count on in decades to come, but we're sure that they'll come along. We have those solutions right now and the thing we're lacking is political will. So I do, I do think we are perhaps in a new moment of political consensus around climate action in Canada. Whether we have achieved the political will that is necessary for the level of action we're talking about is another question. Thank you. Judith, you get to take us home. Last word is yours. Sure. I think feasible, feasible limits us. It doesn't give us the need to push ourselves to innovate, to research and commit ourselves to something greater. And so I think desirability is great because if we know what we want, then we need to find our way there. Let's use what's feasible, but let's also increase that feasible to things that we desire. I mean, a lot, you know, the stuff we're talking about is expensive. It takes time. And so I think if we are um, reasonable in pursuing that, but also recognizing the urgency of what we're dealing with, um, that we can uh, combine many great minds across this country and in the world to try and find some of those other innovations that are more de desirable and that will help us to pace ourselves, but to get to net zero emissions so that we can save the planet basically. So, thank you. Thanks so much panel. I'm gonna hand it back to Elizabeth to wrap things up, but I just wanted to thank the panel for a really great and insightful and smart conversation that, that I thought really was useful and really helpful. 
Uh, so thanks everybody. And thanks to everybody in the chat weighing in and participating with us as well. Elizabeth, back to you. Thanks so much, Dale. Um, I need my uh, wonderful tech support to turn on my video here, but <laughs> my goodness, I've been listening intently and, and what a fantastic, uh, what a fantastic group, what a fantastic lineup of speakers, and just love the remarks at the close from Judith, um, reminding us not to be constrained with um, our current definition of feasibility, uh, because, I, and, and my goodness, if I could leave this group, this audience with anything, it would be that message is let's not be constrained um, by, by what we see as feasible today, uh, because we do, you know, we need to move forward with what's desirable. We can transform our economy. We can transform how we move around, how we produce and use energy. We can do all these things uh, and we shouldn't be confined uh, by what we know today, as well as the fact that we have so many of the technologies, the innovations, and, and the will, right? The, 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 the societal, the political will is at a place that it has never been before. So in that regard, um, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about the policy opportunities, the role of government. And so I, I do wanna close with a final poll just to get a sense from the audience, what is the most important role for government as we look to transform our economy towards net zero? And you have five choices there. And we're asking you to just choose one, which I know can be challenging, but we want, to, we want you to think about what is the most important role, thinking about is it providing the right signals to the private sector through things like carbon pricing? Is it, a, is it about investing in infrastructure to move towards that zero emissions future? Is it about direct, uh, direct public investment in solutions, um, technologies? Is it about ensuring the fairness and the inclusivity of the transition? Or is it about empowering communities and community organizations? So choose your answer. I'm going to choose mine. Um, and we will see what the group is feeling after that incredible, incredible conversation from such a fantastic lineup of speakers. Uh, in the meantime, I want to thank again our speakers and the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices for uh, coming together today. I want to thank all of you, our audience members, for joining uh, for the last 75 minutes. Um, I also want to let you know, oh, and here's the poll results. So uh, top, top of mind for this group is providing those signals to the private sector through carbon pricing. Thank you for your responses. Uh, but of course, we do see emphasis um, on those other uh, on those other mechanisms in terms of uh, government role. Um, and, and I did want to say thank you to the audience for being um, engaged with one another in the chat. That's the kind of opportunity we want to use virtual for um, to really um, engage with speakers, but also engage with one another on these topics. Um, so in that regard, upcoming opportunities to continue this conversation. Um, uh, we will, of course, on April 13th to 15th, be hosting Globe Capital 2021, which will feature an exciting lineup, lineup of speakers mm -hmm. and opportunities um, to connect with your peers in the corporate investment, government, and, and in, in civil society spaces. Um, so both thought leadership, learning opportunities through the program, networking, connectivity opportunities, and of course, B, B2B curated matchmaking to, to meet with um, the folks that you need to connect with to drive forwards uh, in terms of action. On the program at Globe Capital, of course, we'll be working again with the Canadian Institute for Climate Choices on two particular sessions uh, focused on how do we get to destination net zero, looking at both the role of government and, of course, the role of, of corporate uh, Canada and, and globally in, in how we drive towards uh, those carbon neutral objectives. And we'll also hear from uh, elected officials in that regard. Minister O'Regan, of course, announced to be joining us uh, in conversation uh, during the week of Globe Capital and stay tuned for some more uh, announcements in terms of speakers that will be joining us that are, are going to be coming up um, right away today. Uh, so excited to share that. Um, we are now coming up at the close of our session. Thank you again so much for joining us today. Uh, it's been a thrill to connect with you uh, and to connect with these experts and thought leaders uh, talking about how we work towards that more prosperous and just uh, net zero future. Uh, I want to send you away with a call to be safe, um, to be well, uh, and to enjoy the rest of your day wherever you're joining us from. Thank you so much. <laughs>